I want to live in a community that has a midwife and a cheesemaker and a shoemaker and a beekeeper. And I want that intergenerational skill sharing to become common. So this is my job. How do I invite you to grow food? How do I invite you to catch water? How do I invite you to increase biodiversity in your own backyard? And why is that important? This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Behind me is an edible plant nursery. I'm on Port Townsend in the Puget Sound area of Washington State, and my guest is Jenny Pell, who's the founder, let's see if I got this right, the founder and director of the Wilder Institute, which is also permaculture now. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, Mostly. we're a nonprofit permaculture institute based in Port Townsend, but we work all over the world. So how did you get into this line of work? Uh, it's actually kind of a, an interesting route for me. I had done extensive studies in foreign service, mm -hmm. and when I finished college, I went and planted trees in British Columbia for four years. And after my half million trees in the ground, <laughs> um, I took several different lines of work, but that was the time I met my first permaculture people mm -hmm. more than 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And have been influenced by permaculture for years now. And when I had um, finished a corporate business that I ran for a while, I decided I wanted to dedicate my career to permaculture full time. Why? Because it's the most logical and practical and holistic approach to sustainable design and real sustainable human community. And you say community and design. You didn't just say food. Most people think perhaps of permaculture as how do we grow food in a, in a, in a sensible way. That's a fallacy. Permaculture is really, um, there's five different disciplines in permaculture. Okay. There's food, water systems, waste streams, um, natural building, and I forget the last one. <laughs> Whatever, but we'll figure it out. The social, yeah. you'll, it'll come back to you. Yeah. So what they're really, that's really trying to be sort of holistic in terms of what? Yeah. A permanent culture? Yeah, so the word um, originally was coined in Australia 30, 35 years ago, mm -hmm. and it's from permanent agriculture ah. put together. And okay. what we want over time is to have a permanent culture. And so we explore ways of how do we indigenize to place? How do we belong where we live? Mm -hmm. And particularly in the Western culture where we're very transient, yes. we land somewhere and we don't feel like we're from there. That's and right. Why don't we That's feel right. that way? Why don't we belong where we live? Was permaculture, is per permaculture partly a response to, I mean, lowering energy? We talk about peak moment here being, you know, not only peak oil and peak natural gas, but a lot of other materials are peaking and declining, as well as our population is, of course, highest. We're, we're in peak times in a number of ways. Yeah. Isn't permaculture considered sort of a response to knowing this time would be coming? Bill Mollison, who's the founder of permaculture, he lived in Tasmania. Mm. And when he was a young man, he was a fisherman and was a carpenter and had lots of skills and was a botanist. And he noticed in his lifetime, up to in his mid-20s, mm -hmm. 30s, that the n local natural resources were declining rapidly as oh. people had access to fossil fuels where they could ship and extract and you know right. have a much more extractive mentality of their resources. And so he saw people go from very connected, holistic, mm. skilled communities to cutting down the forests and mining the stuff and fishing the waters and, and saw it just <sighs> decline very quickly. And so he started to develop the concepts of permaculture in his own sort of visceral response to that. So for you, kind of, how do you frame the times we are in? How do you think about and what we should be doing and so on? Um, in terms of the peak moments where you, mm -hmm. where you guys come from, you know, you don't measure things in terms of averages. You measure things in terms of extremes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, mm -hmm. when there's a peak heat wave or a peak freezing time, or, and what I feel personally is that we're approaching several peaks at once mm -hmm. based on fossil fuel use. So we're coming into this you know, peak population growth and this peak fossil fuel use and this peak environmental disaster and peak um, extinction and peak losing of species in the ocean, et cetera. And so I feel like you know, global warming, we're about to go like, in this huge oscillation wave before mm -hmm. we come out the other mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a, a confluence of peaks happening at once. Yeah. And um, in my county, which is actually fairly progressive, less than 1% of what we eat is grown in our county. 
Less than 1%. Yeah. And in a and city, it's, it's a fraction of a percent. Probably, you know, you're, it's not unusual. I would expect, that is even not though unusual. this is a rural county and you have not land and water and you can grow. Yeah. Here. So most of our food travels 2,000 miles to get to our plates. And that's really not sustainable. It's not uh, no. sustainable at all. No. And so we have to not just think in terms of organic, we have to think in terms of local. And so local, someone has said the local is the new sustainable. The local, you know, and in sustainable part. is not enough. I don't want to ah. keep the status quo. Oh, good. You know, staying right here is not, not good enough. Well, we have this, to be additive at this point. Yeah, I was going to point that out. Right now, I don't know that we have enough to, if the fossil fuel inputs go down, to be sustainable for this level of population on the planet. Oh, I think I disagree. Do you? I, okay. There's plenty of strategies to grow lots of food and have redundant water systems if you're uh -huh. willing to engage uh -huh. in the process. And, and true, do you think so in terms of also keeping our forests, for keeping our water you know, and, and mm -hmm. land sequestered? Aha, uh -huh. that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite statistics this year was that a garden is four times more productive than a farm. And very few people grow their own food or catch the water off their roof or have a gray water system from their kitchen. You know, when people say, oh, I don't have any water, I can't do that. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. You have lots of water. You just oh. don't know how to trap it. So you're looking at something that's hand-tended Right um, close to your house. More intense, yeah. right? You walk walk on over. We yeah. we've videotaped some where it's yeah. the yard. Yeah. Um, than a farm. Thinking of an industrial farm. Even a farm like this. Uh -huh. Even a farm like this, where you your resources are spread out and you're doing you know crops for market. If you're uh -huh. in the habit of having a big kitchen garden that's designed right, you can have an enormous yield in a tiny piece of land. That's exciting to hear. Oh yeah, that's and exciting. we do a lot of stuff with vertical gardens as well. Ah. So uh, if you even if you have a balcony, you can be growing your own food you know, straight up and yes, down. Yes, That's yes, That's a different way, way to think of it. So any other thoughts about mm, the, the peak? Okay, the peak that we're in, and mm. how, do we, how do we move ourselves towards the additive that you're talking about? Well, this is where permaculture becomes really relevant, in my opinion. This is, you know, taken from David Holgram, Holmgren, who's the co-founder of permaculture. He has a great chart um, that shows, you know, human population up to 1850 kind of expanded a little mm -hmm. bit and then right at that sort of moment where the Industrial Revolution happened and, you know, peak oil started to be huge, um, we went into the energy ascent culture, yes. is what he calls it. Yes, okay. And that's just sort of what's happened on the planet since 1850, where we went from one billion to six and a half billion. Mm -hmm. You know, it took mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. you know, tens of thousands of years <laughs> to get to one billion and then, you know, in 150 years we went Here up we to are. six. Right. And, um, I feel like we've actually passed peak oil. I think, you know, this peak, I think we're already kind of into free fall. A lot of people think. And so in the energy descent culture, what does that look like? And yes. in his graph, he talks, a lot of people think there's going to be a techno fix and it'll go up again. And then some people think, oh, it'll go down a little bit and then the green fix will come in and then we'll level out there. Green but as in, what do you mean by in, green? As in like um, all the renewables, solar, all energy, the renewables. Okay. and you know, and then, okay. then also we'll just, that'll, then it'll all smooth out again. Okay. And some of us think that it's really going to be a real energy descent mm -hmm. culture. And mm -hmm. that's where it becomes really relevant, permaculture, because it is so solution-oriented and it's so logical and it's mm -hmm. so practical and it so makes sense at an absolute epiphany level that you can, um, and, and you have to, when, it, when you have no way to get your stuff from 2,000 miles away, sure. local becomes sure. critical. And I would ask, not only does it make sense, does it work? And how yeah. does it work? And that's, I mean, you've, he's, this has been on our, you've been working permaculture for what, 30 years? I don't know how long it is. Oh, I've been involved with permaculture for about no, I mean, how long has permaculture been here oh. to test out their meth the methods? Yeah, a full generation and more. Okay. So we're now moving okay. into the next generation Good. of permaculture with a lot of expansive concept coming mm -hmm. into play now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of a marrying of um, indigenous knowledge with the best of modern sciences in a very holistic approach. Okay. So we'll take the best of you know, organic farming methods and look at how indigenous tribes manage their systems. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And one of the things I talk about a lot in my courses is becoming incarnate in the place that you live. Well, what does that mean? You know, if you live in an apartment building in a city, you don't even touch the ground. Right. Right, and you don't know where your water comes you from. You don't know where your water comes. You don't know where your food comes from. Right, and, um, and you, you don't know where no the sewage goes, and you don't yeah, all those things. Yeah, so you're, where so your you're, waste you're disconnected goes. from yes. your whole chain, yes. and you don't have a relationship with your water, or with your food, or mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. know, or often with your neighbors. That's true. Right? So even That's true. We're just family, isolated you in many ways. Isolated. So when you work outdoors or live outdoors, you know, your hair comes out and your nails fall off, and your, you know, and those things are eaten by the microbes in the soil, and yes. you become yes. part of that place. Oh, and then if you eat the food from there, that it's place becomes part of you. you. Yes, yes. And, that, and then in that sort of observation, participation loop, you start to belong where you are. 
Mm. And when you're in a city or when you're in a place where you mm. don't have any of those relationships intact, you don't feel like you belong there. So you can destroy it or damage it and you don't And you, you don't, don't even care. know you're not aware of that. No, and you don't really care. That's probably true. You really don't care. You don't, it's not, it doesn't occur to you that, to, that the love you have for your whole family, not just your human family, mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. it's not intact anymore. Well, we've had a huge, huge, well, in, since that time of the Industrial Revolution, a huge load of the disconnections made possible because we can yeah. transport ourselves much farther. We yeah. can go away from the stuff we want to avoid. We can pretend it's not there. You know, the landfill yeah. that gets barged over to China and so on. Yeah, and the skills that we've lost in the last few generations are mm -hmm. tremendous. Mm -hmm. I just did a workshop um, and I asked my audience, we had 35 countries represented and a uh, fairly large audience. And I said, how many people here grow their own food? I was one, and there were two or three other people in an audience of several hundred. And I said, how many people's grandmothers grew food? More than half the audience put their okay. hand up. Okay. I said, that's a lot of skills to lose in two generations. Mm. Mm. You're right. You're and right. the elders aren't passing the information on because you're not interested. Yes. You know, I, you're, yes, you're I all the people, Especially in Europe where people, young people leave this, you know, the towns and they want to go to the city where it's interesting. Right. And the, these you know, beautiful old towns are populated with very old people and nobody to pass their skills on to. And, and that's a loss because they've got generations of knowledge of why you plant this here and this is the variety that works here and you, and if you, you know, see this, do this that. And, and, yeah. and I, 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 my concern is that, that loss of, that's a loss of knowledge that will only be won back by more trial and error and it, we could have saved a lot of yes, wasted time. the same time, with the will. indigenous loss. You know, every, every indigenous person we lose is a body of lore that we don't have anymore, particularly when the languages are gone. Because the language yeah, of indigenous yeah. people, sure. the language of the sure. land and of the water and of drought and of famine, and you know, it's, it's included in their vocabulary as people who are indigenous. So are you doing things to, any things to help um, sequester, get that knowledge from indigenous places or from this people in your people, locale? Yeah, that, that's a good question. A lot of people in the permaculture movement are very involved with indigenous mm -hmm. information gleaning mm -hmm. and, and relationship. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. and if one of the things I do, for example, in Central America, we have several plant nursery projects down there. And one of my jobs periodically is to run around the bioregion and look for the best genetic material. Okay. So I go to private fruit collections and I go to botanical gardens and I go to the market and I'll, you know, meet some indigenous family and they'll have the most delicious fruit I ever had. And I'll go within the dugout canoe up to their village and I'll glean seeds and mm -hmm. I'll get, you know, cuttings. And then I get them across borders and plant them in our nurseries. So we're spreading these really excellent genetics that are from that bioregion around the bioregion. I was going to say to stay within that bioregion probably because that's where yeah. they last the best or work the best. Yeah, Although well, actually, you know, I almost you want to try a lot of places because you might be surprised that something. Yes, you do. Yeah. Would yeah. Be and I, this is a challenging question for me. A lot of people when I present, want to know, aren't I, aren't I concerned about introducing exotics? I'm like, you're the invasive exotic. <laughs> and, you know, and what did you have? And then my next question is, what did you have for breakfast? Oh. oh, I had wheat cereal, and I had cow's milk, and I had peaches, and I had, and they'll list all these things. Right. None of them are from where they live. Like, if I was going to eat a local diet, right. I would eat salmon and berries and deer. Yes. And yes. I'd dig some roots and yes. I'd eat shellfish. That's true. All of those things came over here, unless you were, say, from the, the southwest in, in America or the middle Latin America, and you'd be eating corn and beans and squash. But even so, many, many of their products now are yes. from other places. Yes, yes. And yeah, so with my sure. plant nursery here, which is all edible perennials, which means that they grow year after year, and okay. they get a larger harvest every year, um, is to look all over the world for the best and most delicious mm -hmm. and most disease resistant and most mm -hmm. frost resistant mm -hmm. um, plants that are appropriate for humans to eat. Excellent. In a sense, you're doing a, um, your collections are also a kind of savings bank, an investment bank for you us. You bet. For that genetic material. Yeah, and this is, um, you know, one of our mottos is, you know, more food here now. So more food here now. So that it's not just 1% in no. your locale, not and even five or no. ten. And the skills around it start to be uh, embodied in the population. So what kinds of things do you teach then since um, around all this? Tomorrow I'm doing a grafting class. Grafting, okay, for, for fruit trees? For fruit, fruit trees, nut trees and I don't think we're doing any of this, but mostly fruit okay. trees. All right. So a lot of people don't know this, most fruits that you eat don't grow true to seed. Mm -hmm. So if you eat a really delicious mm -hmm. apple and you took those seeds and planted them, none of them would taste remotely like what you just ate. They'd probably be really tiny, sour uh -huh. crab apples. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So almost any variety that you've ever eaten came from one original tree that someone noticed was really delicious. 
and they grafted that. So okay. apples, pears, peaches, plums, nectarines, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all, all citrus, avocados, mangoes. Right. And it's a skill that many thousands of years ago were developed in different parts of the globe, huh, unbeknownst huh. to the other groups. So, grafting. What I did a, last month. We, we do one workshop a month mm -hmm. here in Port Townsend mm -hmm. when, when I'm in the country. Um, last time we did fungi. We okay. did a mushroom workshop. Okay. And we had 25 people come. We talked about mushrooms in your garden, what they do, and mycelium, and the incredible network of mycelium underground, and the intelligence of mushrooms. Yes, the, the network underground. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it turns out that mushrooms share information through this vast chemical network, and they feed wow. from the, like, they, there's ecto, you know, they go in the roots, and they surround the roots, uh -huh, uh -huh. and then when the, the trees photosynthesize, the sugars feed the mushrooms. Okay. And the sugars okay. can actually read the health of, the, and the mushrooms can actually read the health of the wow. plants. And so wow. if one plant needs something, they can pull those chemicals from somewhere else. God, there's so much wisdom that we probably haven't the faintest, I mean, yeah. like that, faintest idea about. And so, you know, when you can promote a really healthy fungal system in your garden, um, you will have a much, much more prosperous garden. So in the fungi workshop, we did, um, you know, King Strafaria, which is a garden giant. The mushroom is about this big. No. It'll feed 10 people for dinner. Whoa. And we did, um, you know, particular mycelium. Then we did uh, lion's mane and shiitakes. And mm -hmm. we, did, mm -hmm. we taught Things people we how know. to do seven or eight different kinds of mushrooms. So I'm going to sort of step sideways for a second because this is still local. Mm -hmm. I understand that you're interested in or starting to work on a gleaning project here yeah. locally. Yeah, which gleaning has me. really caught my interest for many years. And now I have an opportunity to do some work on it. Um, in many countries in Europe in particular, they have gleaning laws and gleaning rights. Uh -huh. So after the farmer has finished their harvest, by law, you can go in and take what's left. Really? Following a certain etiquette. Okay. Okay. So even to the point of, you know, very unlike the United States, um, where when there's a bounty of a crop, they just sits in mountains and rots. I, right. right? And, and I mean, Which is really it just, I distressing mean, to me. I'm with you. I, okay. It's like I live in peach country and nectarine, you know, just down the slopes of Sierra. It's like I know that they are not allowed to sell, even as seconds, even to no. give away. The, it's no. like this is criminal. So, yeah, so there's one in France where they, I've seen a, there's a great documentary on gleaning in France. And... Um, the potato company, after they've taken the potatoes that are this big as the only ones they want, they have mountains of potatoes outside, and people just drive up in their cars and fill up sacks. But even in the grape harvest, so they, they take through, and whatever's left, you can just go. And you can actually sometimes go 50 feet behind and follow them down. Oh, wow. Well, they, so they allow you the people into the fields to sometimes. Yeah. Or sometimes some it depends on the farmer, and then other times you have to wait until they're, they're really I done see. harvesting. I see. But you can do it with wheat, and you can do it with fruit, and you can do it with nuts, and yes. you can do it. It's a law. It's an old, old practice as it's well. It's an ancient practice. And it's actually, um, there's a, whole, a lot of gleaning information in the Bible for people who are right. Christian. I remember, there's you know, whole Ruth, gleaning. Ruth yes. was gleaning the barley with her. Yes. her so this Emily. is like, even here, like we're sitting behind a raspberry patch. Yes. They're done with the harvest. Really? This, I mean, we just had a few. Yes. <laughs> we gleaned some raspberries. So I could probably make 10 jars of jam Easily. still. I believe that. Yeah. So what can be done in a local, what can people do in a locale okay. about well, gleaning? The first thing you want to do is map what you got. Mm. So mm. Port Townsend, fortunately for us, thank you very much for all those people who planted those fruit trees 20, 50 years ago. Yeah. We have cherries and apples and plums and pears and all stuff growing around town. And you can actually just go up to the person's house and knock on the door and say, I see that your pear tree is full of pears and really ripe and I'd like to harvest some. Can I harvest some for you at the same time or I'll bring you back some jam? Right. And right. most people don't want to bother with their pears. And right. Okay, so there's, there's one you can have a direct contact with mm -hmm, the person mm -hmm, that owns it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be copying a program from Victoria, Canada. It's called the Fruit Tree Project. And people who have fruit trees that they're not going to harvest will call up the nonprofit office and say, okay. I have an apple tree and I would love for you to come get it. And they have volunteers that go. And the volunteers can take home harvest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They um, give a certain percent to the food bank. Okay. They'll leave okay. some for the owner if they want it. Yes. And then the certain percentage they make into juice and sell for profit to support oh, the so project. So uh, many people are benefiting yes. from this one. Yeah. So thing. I think a lot of people don't realize that there's an enormous abundance right yes. in their in their neighborhoods yes. Yes. and um and it's fun now do the question practical because i want to start this and get it started in our community yeah. do the gleaners bring their fruit ladders yes and their whatever to, yeah. you know to pick and yeah. do they get involved with any of the pruning or do they offer that service if we, if Prune, desired uh, pruning's at a different time of year Re yes certainly and that's a good question i don't i haven't really thought about that it would be a great service to offer it's a skill, of course, and it's at a different time of year. Sure, I, it just occurred to me that that might be the, the another part of the exchange. It would be a really great one to do because it would start to really get a skill mm. landed in a community, yeah. and um, and we were all t and it gives us a sense of we are taking care of these trees. Yeah, you know, we. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm going to bounce back for a okay. second because you've just come back from Portugal. Yeah. And I'm interested to know what you're doing internationally. You okay. you said interesting stuff. Yeah. This was a really unique contract. I was hired to go to a music trance festival. Music trance festival. Okay. Of 20, 25,000 people Whew. in um, central interior Portugal. Um, because the festival decided after, they do it every other year, and that after the last one, they sort of looked at the mom momentous amount of garbage that they created mm. and said, we can't do this anymore. So they made a firm decision to move the festival into a uh, sustainable direction. So I was one of their featured speakers, and they had a few other permaculture people there, and it was a really challenging experience <laughs> because they're so far behind the curve in terms of sustainability that our stuff was was uh, stunning to people. Really? So I was hired to go in. I was there three weeks and I did a huge permaculture garden installation. I had staff and a budget and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then 70 Balinese men came in to build these bamboo structures. And we had a almost a 100 foot by 100 foot bamboo structure that was stunningly beautiful that mm -hmm. I designed all the gardens for, mm -hmm. associated with an art gallery. And then we did workshops and presentations and films 24 hours a day. Wow, wow. And um, it was really hard to see that they didn't have any free drinking water. They only sold water and bottled bottles. Water. And so for staff, we would get the liter and a half bottles. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. who are drinking and partying and dancing, and it's 105 degrees in a heat wave, they would only sell them little bottles of water. And so the amount of garbage, that they, the amount of plastic garbage they generated in, in six days, while well, we were there, I was there for, for longer, and the staff is there for much longer, it was shocking. It was just shocking. And so that was the kind of stuff where post-festival we're going to meet with them and offer them solutions to move forward from here. Like how do, how do they how do they How do they that? do that differently because you yeah. just don't need all those. I, it, yeah. Yes. And I think I had romanticized Europe to some degree. I was expecting them to be more enlightened because they don't have genetically engineered <laughs> products on their shelves. You know, so it's like, of course, you know, they're ahead of us on all those curves, us, and, you know, right? And I, it was an interesting metaphor for me because people, you know, everyone's smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Wow. And the label says, smoking kills. And it's this huge label. Or smoking causes a slow and painful death, and they're just smoking, 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 smoking. And I thought, this is an interesting metaphor for what we're doing to the planet. Mm. Like, we know we're damaging the planet. We know that mm. these choices lead us down this path, and we still do it knowing what the consequences are. And why do we do that? And I'm, this is the, my challenge. Like, how do I answer that question? And how do I invite people like that into this process? How do, how, I do not, we, how do I not challenge them in a way that they right. feel bad? So you don't blame them, and you don't... Yes, you, because it's yeah. got to be... It's not going to be adversarial, or they'll, you know, they'll turn off. Yeah, and this is a challenge for me because um, to be to not be judgmental mm -hmm. when you're mm -hmm. feeling really judgmental, <laughs> you're like, what are you doing? Um, and, and, and instead make it an invitation. And, and I think one of the fallacies that people get stuck on is that when they hear the word sustainable, they think, oh, I've got to give up all this stuff. Yes, I think that notion of deprivation is a biggie. It's like... Notion of deprivation. And what they don't realize is sustainable actually means abundance. And mm -hmm. not sustainable means utter poverty for the planet and for our human family. And eventually, you know, if we continue on that, the path, lots on the planet won't be here. Yeah, well, that's a great quote deeply heard, unsustainable. Um, if we keep going the way that we're going, we might just get where we're headed. You know, and which is <laughs> <laughs> which is everything outfished and and, yeah. and and yeah. And so also while I was in Portugal, sort of, you know, processing this, twenty thousand people just being oblivious to the most for the most part really impressed with our stuff you know really really moved by what excellent. we were doing that excellent. was good um half of portugal was on fire there was a fifth hottest summer in a row on record um I, there was reports of the ocean temperatures all down the portuguese seaboard were going up and mm -hmm. the marine life is dying mm -hmm. off and then mm -hmm. all the crops of northern italy died in a drought Serious. this summer just now this is now. so this here is we time. are we're watching okay. we're watching the climate crisis yes in its face, I mean, heating up much more quickly. Yeah. I mean, while yeah. you were gone, probably is when the inconvenient truth came out from Al Gore. It's around now yeah. saying, yeah. folks, hello. Yeah. And so that was for me, it was an interesting mm. juxtaposition of young people who do know better, who are choosing this and evidence all around me of, you know, global warming and peak oil mm. and mm. the war in Israel and Lebanon and, yeah. and Iran and Iraq and the highest number of casualties and, yes. and people... Yes going to a festival to become relatively oblivious, you know, in, in a more, in a way, it was, I'm, so I'm still sort of thinking about what that means and how do I work with that. So that 
question you're wrestling with is what keeps you it's like what can keep you motivated and inspired both how to how to respond to people who need to be awakened you hope will be awakened yeah what well, how do you you know how do you what do you i mean i'm not saying you have the answer yet i have, i see yeah. that you're on the, you're you're looking for that yeah well, I have a lot of teachers. You know, one of the groups that's influenced me a lot is the Bioneers. Yeah. Bioneers Network. I've been involved with them for many, many years. And I learn a lot every time I go there. And I feel like a sponge. I go there and just get filled up and I can sort of drip that all year long. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, for a lot of people, they think it's, it's all concrete stuff. Oh, if I plant a garden or if I build a water system or if I have a solar panel. Right. Um, but it has a lot more to do with the energy that you're giving off and pulling towards you. You know, you, you can choose to be angry and you can choose to be, uh, have no hope and you can choose to just say, well, obviously the species is doomed, so I'm just going to do whatever I want. Yeah, that's right. But we, you can also pull to you grace and joy and beauty and, and realize that participating in that creates a different resonance with you, with your environment, with your community, with your family and with our greater family of kin. And I think many people now are starting to understand that Yes, we're related to everything. Uh -huh. yes. We all co-evolve yes. together. Yes, yes. But what people aren't getting, which I really think is important, is that you can have a relationship with everything, and you can have a very deep relationship with things if you choose. If you sit and observe an insect in a flower, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. have a relationship that, mm -hmm. that they 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 know that you're there. Sure, you know. Sure, we don't think about that. We yeah. we tend to have this sort of anthropos you know, I'm the center of the universe kind of yeah. mentality to not sense that. The raspberries are listening yeah. to us. They know we're here. They know we're here. There's, there's a, we have a presence, and that's that part of belonging where you are, mm. is, is having a presence that mm. doesn't damage. And that's the first ethic of permaculture is to care for the earth. Can you, can you, in your everyday decisions, not hurt the planet? Like if you're going to drink coffee, is it organic? Because it's not. It's full of chemicals, and the soil's polluted, and the people working it are polluted, and right. you know the chain of chemicals that goes up. Okay? Right. right. Um, is it fair trade? Because if it's not... They're getting paid in rice, and they don't make a wage. They can barely feed their families. They right. can barely stay alive. Right. And if it's not shade-grown, it's baking under the hot sun, and they cut down all the trees. If you're, and if you're buying it in a cup with a plastic lid, that's a petrochemical product. You know, it's like, right. You know, right. In, you know, and it's a white paper cup, so it has dioxin in it because exactly. they bleached it, which is exactly. making, you know, okay. all down the Mississippi yeah. toxic. Yes. And it is as simple as that. Take your own cup, buy organic, buy fair trade. Because if you're not choosing that, you're choosing the other thing. You're directly contributing to that. Every dollar you spend is a vote for that feature or for that feature. This is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you. This is, thank you for joining me. You're watching Peak Moment, Community Responses for a Changing Energy Future. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Join us next time.